At long last, we have finally reached the last two episodes of Netflix's live-action Avatar The Last Airbender. And man, has this been a long and at times very painful journey. While the original cartoon was praised for its world-building, character drama, and authentic martial arts action, the Netflix version seemed to really struggle finding its own identity with the first few episodes until it found its own path forward with the later half of the season. So did season one end on a high note, or did it sink even further below expectation? Well, it's time to bow in and analyze the martial arts in Avatar's season one finale. Episode 7 knows just how to put the right foot forward as Zuko is tricked into escaping on a small boat rigged with explosives. Meanwhile, the Netflix gang reach the North Pole, nice transition here by the way, and Zhao has some back and forth with Iroh before we get to our first little action block with Azula versus an Earthbender prisoner. And this scene right here is just really weak. They're doing the one thing I wish they wouldn't have with this character, and that was to try and make her a highly mobile warrior. Let's just ignore that this fire boost jump here looks like ass, and that when she performs the flash kick here, suddenly the outfit fits looser and her cheekbones become angular like the cartoon. Almost like it's a different person in there. But all of that is still not as bad as this hand slicing stuff she's doing that looks like something Frieza was pulling on Namek. However, it's not all bad, and I've got to give a little bit of credit here, because these rolling fists at the end were actually pretty well done, especially with all the visuals. I can tell she practiced these movements, and the VFX helped to elevate them. The Fire Lord deems your performance below average. I've got to agree with you. No stance work, you used a stunt double, and all your choreography was was a bunch of hand waving. I'm sorry, are you an airbender or a firebender, ma'am? But... Let's play devil's advocate for a second. Maybe this is all a misinterpretation on my part, and she's not supposed to be seen as the best. Shut up, May. Seriously, though, if the audience is meant to look at this character and say, whoa, this chick is a badass, then they're failing. But if we're meant to look at this and say, yeah, it needs some work, then they're actually doing a good job. Again, look no further than the last fight scene we had with the blue spirit. If she's supposed to be better than him, then they are doing an awful job here, because this chick is the least visually impressive character on the show. And if I've said it once, then I'll say it a thousand more times. That ain't the actress's fault. That's on the director, the writer, and the choreographer for not working within her own skill set. And also, just a little insider secret here, it helps if you don't shoot your badass characters in ways that make them look like a turtle. She easily could have been portrayed as incredibly talented because martial arts itself covers a wide range of different skills and styles. And not just acrobatics. So it's only a little embarrassing when you have one of your characters performing a move using an obvious stunt double and a wire when the character she is supposed to be inherently better than can do it in real life with no stunt double or wire work necessary. And I know I should move on from this, but guys, the flash kick is a basic trick. So it is doubly unfortunate that both Mei and Azula's stunt doubles are not only profoundly talented martial artists in real life, but they also look the part better than the actresses do. And I truly mean this with no offense intended, but I have yet to see any acting on display here that the stunt doubles couldn't have also done. The only issue with the stunt women is that they look older, because they are. But hear me out. If this was the new direction they wanted to take Azula and Ozai's relationship in, then, you know, wouldn't it have made more sense to just age up Azula so that she's the older sibling who gets passed over in favor of a younger son? If they can make Yue a furry, then why couldn't they have made Azula the older child? I know, there are more than enough complaints about the show already, but sometimes I can't help but get the gross feeling they cast Elizabeth Yu knowing it would cause controversy, and that's just f***ed up to do to that actress. And speaking of changes, not only can Yue anamorph into my homie's wet dream, she's also a bender now, which I'm cool with. I'm also cool with this Sokka and this UA's dynamics. I think this is some cute shit, and I'm about it. Even Han got a cool change up from the original cartoon. Instead of being written like a generic 80s cartoon villain like he was in the original, 
This Han is much more open and understanding as a character because Yue declined his marriage proposal. And it leads to this Han being one of the few male peers from Sokka's own people that respects his values as a warrior. At least in the beginning. And that's Sokka's entire arc. So yeah, I kinda like this Han more. At least Paku's still an ass though. I gotta tell ya, something I've noticed in all of the many Aang dialogue scenes I've been skipping over is that Gordon is a head shake actor. Like, he doesn't use his body to emote. It's oddly stilted, almost like he's looking at a sleep paralysis demon. All the while, his head constantly does that little side-to-side -side shake every time he's gotta deliver something important. It reminds me of Daisy Ridley's open mouth acting. Once you notice, she never closes her mouth all the way. You can't unsee it. Moving on. I fear I've underestimated Chow. He's more dangerous than I thought. Yeah, I figured that out as I was swimming away from the burning wreck of my boat. Oh my god, man, this is so golden. I just love these two characters so much. Their chemistry is always on point for me. But chemistry just seems to be a thing in the royal family as a whole. And you know, as hard as I was on poor Azula in that first scene, I think this girl is absolutely crushing it in this one. From the princess refusing to play daddy's game, causing Ozai to treat his daughter just like he does his son, even their lightning choreography is on point here. Except for this pose. This is pretty cringe. Stop that shit. that's a bad choreographer. But I want to talk about this lightning choreography again, because a lot of those movements are from Wushu compulsory forms. She even hits a pretty good front stance here. Uh, granted, it could be deeper like everything else, but you know, if she keeps putting in the work like this, she'll be able to handle the fight scenes in season two just fine, as long as they don't try to choreograph her as an acrobat or an infighter. But after this, we gotta pop in with Sokka so he can tell Katara to kick an old man's ass. But of course, we have more water bending that doesn't make anybody wet. This is the finale, guys. You're not even trying here. However, when the fight begins properly, we get some good Tai Chi Chuan from Paku that ends up being redirected by Katara using Tai Chi Jian movements, particularly this position right here. Tai Chi is rather infamous for both its empty hand and its sword routines, so this was actually a pretty clever addition. Unfortunately, this fight only manages to keep me on board for like two seconds because for whatever reason, the director and choreographer decided it would be a good idea to have the waterbenders fight up close. I'm not gonna lie, you completely lost me here, guys. Katara was the only character who maintained distance the entire span of the show, except for the one time that Jet tried to put the moves on her in Omashu. But you are trying to tell me that now she can somehow apply all of this to melee infighting? Get the f*** out of here with that. At the very least, this is authentic Chinese martial art trapping, and the usage of Pak Sao as well as Lop Sao brings it rather close to Wing Chun territory. Unfortunately, we can't even appreciate what's all happening here, because there are 11 f***ing cuts in 4 seconds. Are you kidding me here? Why are people still doing this shit? Who looked at this fight and thought, yeah, you know what, I'd like to not know what's happening here. At least the final edit here transitions into a wonderful Tai Chi Chuan movement that causes Katara to fling an ice shard. Then Paku's gotta ruin everything by casting Blizzard. I mean, there is a little bit of movement here, but let's be honest, these are caster hands, not martial arts. This fight, though, is not over, because round two opens with Katara popping the f*** off. This all looks fantastic, and not only is Kia crushing these movements here, but I think her stance work is actually objectively better than Paku's. Because if you'll notice, he never deepens his squat nearly as much as our girl does here. And although the wire work is still weak, I need you to listen to this. She grunts when creating the ice pillar, which not only adds weight to the movement, but helps sell it that that is a real world object that she's interacting with. I have never been more impressed by an actor's physical performance while simultaneously being bored by the actual character itself. All of this greatness is followed up by more wonderful choreography choices from Paku. This motion he's making here is literally called Begin Tai Chi and is the opener for almost every single Tai Chi Chuan routine. But they've repurposed it here as the motion that drives his ice manning, and it's genius. 
This all wraps up with Paku throwing some arm whips that vaguely resemble Repulse the Monkey from Tai Chi before just trapping Katara in an icicle ring. Honestly, considering that her entire training history was confined to just this production, I think Kia has done a fantastic job representing Tai Chi Chuan. I know a ton of people in the comments were hating on this fight and warning me about it, but I'm sorry haters, this is actually one of the better fights from a martial arts standpoint. And a lot of that is chalked up to Kia's performance. All in all, I really think that Episode 7 did a good job of carrying Episode 6's momentum forward, but now we gotta see if the last episode can close everything out with a bang. And you all know what that means, it is time to bow in to Episode 8 and wrap this season up. Okay, let's get this season over with by jumping right into an action scene between Aang and the firebending vessel at the North Pole. And talk about putting the right foot forward. This is all awesome, my dude. Aang's staff work pops right out of a Wu Shaw film, and he's even got some nice Fagua movements in there too. Never one to be outdone, Katara steps in, and not only does she nail this single whip here, but they even threw water on the door. I mean, check that out. They got a water budget for this episode. Truly, these guys have spared no expense for the first season finale. We're even treated to a nice little combo attack that is not only well shot, but also complemented by the slow motion. Katara looks like she's performing a take on Grab the Sparrow's Tail from Tai Chi, and believe it or not, Aang's baseball swing with the staff is actually an authentic Chinese martial art move found in a lot of staff routines. My only negative here is that god-awful CGI shot, but even then, I'm still excited to see how the rest of the action plays out. Nice job, troops. Those flame heads aren't going anywhere. Thanks to your plan. That's some kick teamwork. The dialogue could still use some work, but so far, so good. But let's just skip forward a couple of minutes and get to the beginning of the siege. Aang opens up the conflict with a nice staff lurch that we've seen before, and it's framed excellently. I don't even mind the hero posing that much. Meanwhile, we get some good distant shots of waterbenders using some basic Tai Chi to stop the fireballs, and again, so far, so good. We're even treated to this nice moment between Han and Sokka. As I said earlier, I like this a lot more than the original. Still don't think Sokka and Yue's relationship is that great, but I don't hate any of this. And I will tell you what else I like. This group of collective waterbenders performing a synced up snake creeps through the grass. Dima. This is good shit. If you spot any incoming fireballs, don't try to take them on yourself. Let me know. Yes, Master Katara. What? I'm not a... I'm not exactly sure how I feel about Katara being called a master this early on, but kids get their black belts at 12 years old nowadays, so maybe the Northern Water Tribe is just a McDojo. If you got that joke, you're a real martial artist. Either way, you're going to have to forgive me because for now, we're going to skip past just all of this plot and skip right to the next fight scene between Katara and Zuko. In a truly shocking twist, my only issue is with this first movement from Dallas. Don't get me wrong, this is actually part of a northern Shaolin Daolu, but when we cut to the reverse shot of the fireball colliding with Katara's attack, the movements don't match. Because if this was the choreography that ends in a deep bow stance, then that means that this vertical fist snap kick was meant to be the, pun intended, warm up for this tiger claw bow stance. It's not the worst thing ever by far. It's not even the worst thing in this episode. It's just a little mistiming that I happened to notice. This next exchange sees Zuko hit a spin step into a cheap parafuso that Katara blocks with a redirection. This transitions into a gorgeous deep bow stance that is unfortunately soured by being paired with a claw strike. And I just gotta say it. At this point into the show, I am convinced that the reason there are so many claw strikes instead of vertical fists is because nobody involved in this production realized how often they used vertical punches in the original cartoon. And that is why we mainly see vertical fists in this show from stunt performers who know actual martial arts and are not the focus of the scene. Getting back to the fight, Katara takes the first round by sweeping the leg. The second bout is going to begin with Katara missing a whip while Zuko counters with a 540 kick slash sideswipe. It's kind of nebulous which trick it is at this angle, but I'll tell you what isn't, and that's how often he does these tricks. Because these must have been the moves that got Dallas hired. 
I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I do gotta ask. Where's the variety at, King? You could just turn these into a swipe knife or a jackknife at this point. I also really don't like this movement that looks like it's halfway between a haymaker punch and a softball pitch. That shit was dumb. Nor am I a big fan, ever, of this CGI nonsense with Katara. And even though I do like the ice wall she makes, Zuko ends up throwing a Hadouken and it takes me completely out of the fight. I mean, my man even cooks it like one. But you know what? It's okay, because regardless, Katara ends up taking round two because she traps Zuko in ice, only to have him break out using his Breath of Fire technique that was established earlier in the episode. And besides being annoyed at cutting away from the action again, this scene did something incredible. It may be the only scene in the show that Iroh has actually let me down in. Because bro, you need to take a martial arts stance if you're gonna threaten somebody. Please. Everyone in this show has these moments where they stand around stiffly and awkwardly with little to no body language. Almost like they forgot that everything below the neck can help them emote. So overall it ends up looking mid because this fireball is filmed as an upper third shot, even though we have some nice Bagua Zhang complimenting it. Overall the scene wasn't too bad, it just kind of held back by the stunted acting. But now it's time for a little brawling, so let's get to the Water Tribe Warriors fighting the Firebenders. And yeah, this is actually really well choreographed, with Yue's father transitioning nicely between the opponents and his movements. So while there's no real martial arts being displayed here, and it kind of falls into that generic Battlefield 101 stuff like you'd see in Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, that doesn't stop it from being really well timed and having all the beats be on point. From here though, we transition into Han's golden moment, and he carries the momentum forward really well. All of his beats are on point, he's timed out, he meets his marks, and he even gets some burns on his face. And I gotta say, I really like that last little detail the most, but Netflix, please step up the clothing damage for season two. To be fair though, that was also a serious problem with the original cartoon. Outside of like, key moments, it never felt like people were really getting burned or dirty, you know what I mean? Anyways, the only lame part of this scuffle is the slow-mo turn that does nothing. The firebender isn't doing anything, so this is either a hiccup or just something they threw in because it looked cool. Gotta keep the finale rolling, however, as now we see Iroh get really pissed off and try to light up Zhao. Even though we get some vertical fist action, it still just looks like an old man that can't move all that well. Like, what even happened here with this guy? But who cares about that? Because we have finally arrived at the last fight for season one. Zuko versus Zhao. For starters, we open with a beautiful vertical fist, followed up by my personal favorite, more awkward standing around. Dude, do something with your body language. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? Dallas just looks like he's standing around lifting his shoulders up, and I'm sorry, but tis a little goofy for me. But I'll tell you what's not goofy, and that's this choreography right here. We get an awesome B-twist shuriken followed by a deep double palm strike. While I still don't like how this show handles wire work or slow motion, the follow-up blast from Zhao and Zuko's Sailor Moon swipe are visually amazing. That is some points for just the creativity alone. The battle rages on with Zhao firing a blast that Zuko kicks away and returns using a pose that really should have been drop stance, but horse is good enough I guess. And if you couldn't tell by their movements and how this was being framed, it was all just an elaborate setup for them to move into hand to hand fighting. Zhao leads with a straight claw that Zuko parries and counters with an overhead elbow, only to follow up with a poorly done haymaker due to a lack of hip movement. Which then leads to Zhao throwing yet another haymaker in this fight scene directly at Zuko's head. And you know what that means! In this show, if one guy is haymaking, that other guy, he's probably ducking. Really, really creative. And after evading, Zuko goes directly into windmilling arms, which somehow catches a punch aimed at his gut, I think. Inconclusive. This all leads to an awkward overhead shot where we watch Zuko wheel Zhao over his back before hitting him with a butt punch and stepping away so he can throw an absolutely picture perfect moon kick semi before power posing like an absolute champ. I'm a bit torn because I'm not exactly a big fan of benders suddenly not bending when they're in close range, but on the other hand, I actually think this is a passable close combat exchange. 
It's quick and the tempo is pretty nice, but the lack of strong guards and choreography choices, as well as the poor choice to film it up close, leaves a lot to be desired. And even the highlight of this moment, where Zuko throws a moon kick, is shot at a distance and edited too fast to be impactful. To show you what I'm talking about, this is how I would have edited that. See, the idea with tricking or acrobatics in general isn't to try and sell it as some realistic technique. It's to highlight the lines and shapes that we make while we perform them. But then we get to these last few blows that close out the brawl, and I'm sorry, but to me, these are pretty damn weak choices to close out the final fight of your season. Yao does this goofy-ass lunging punch that Zuko blocks with a weird forceful karate guard. And of course, because we haven't had enough haymakers in this show yet, Zuko rocks Zhao with one before stepping in to deliver a sidekick that is shot and edited so poorly, I thought it hit him in the hip. I sincerely don't understand the logic of inserting this last shot right here. We desperately needed to see this film from an angle that really sells it as the final blow, but because of the way it is now, it just ends up leaving the fight feeling like a wet fart. And one last complaint, they're on a bridge. How did Iroh blast Zhao into the water when he was standing to their side? Oh, honestly, it doesn't really matter, because that is what closes the final fight of the episode, and therefore, the final fight of season one. Despite my criticisms, this show really stepped the hell up in the action department, with Kyo and Tio in particular being a consistent highlight for me. The show may have a bad case of caster hands, but I think I was onto something when I placed a majority of the blame on poor direction for those first two episodes and their fight sequences. Episode 6 was really damn cool, and it's gotten significantly easier to separate this from the source material, especially after wild changes like UA's spirit persona. I'm excited to see what comes next for Season 2, since that's when we're gonna get Toph and Ty Lee thrown down, and those are some pretty big shoes to fill. Not to mention there are some incredibly powerful episodes that you just know they're gonna adapt, like Zuko alone. My only hope is this. They need to bring a martial arts consultant on board. It doesn't have to be Sifu Kisu, but there needs to be somebody there for every episode, regardless of the director or writer team. And the other thing I would really like for them to do is come up with a strong vision for the vibe of the show. Right now it feels like they're shooting it like any other series, and that is just not gonna work for Avatar, my guys. Y'all got lucky with this first run, let's be real here. This got the viewership it did because of brand recognition, not quality. Thankfully after the halfway mark, there was something genuinely worth watching here as it progressed and it became its own thing. But y'all gotta dial all the way in on a clear idea for what this show is filmed and shot like, because otherwise it's gonna end up like the Bumblebee movie. That was probably the best of the live-action Transformer flicks, but not many people saw it because number 5 was so awful. We kind of have the same issue here. Season 2 is most likely going to have less viewership by default, but if the team over at Netflix really digs their heels in and puts a focused, concentrated idea on screen, this has the potential to be fantastic. So, did I leave anything out? And more importantly guys, what series would you like to see me analyze next? I've had a bunch of people suggest that I analyze the John Wick franchise, but there's also the original Avatar show I could do, as well as martial art classics like Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Tony Jaa, and Jet Li, and even franchises that aren't strictly associated with martial arts, like Marvel, DC, or Star Wars media. And do not even get me started on all of the anime I could talk about. Whatever you would like to see, make sure you let me know in the comments, because that is how I'm gonna pick what we do next. As always, feel free to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you want to see more martial arts analysis and media. But until next time everyone, I am bowing out and I'll see you all in the next series.